Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, last and final session of this uh, excellent conference. Um, I'm Jonathan Portis. Um, I'm Professor of Economics and Public Policy at King's College London, um, and uh, very pleased to be chairing this, uh, this final panel. Uh, this um, is going to, uh, panel is going to examine um, one of the most topical um, subjects in uh, um, economic and indeed more broadly um, uh, population and social and uh, economic statistics um, currently in the UK. Um, the question of what has happened and is happening to UK population and migration during the pandemic, um, a period during which um, we've seen um, massive uh, change in terms of the, obviously the economic and social environment resulting from the, uh, the pandemic, which we know has had um, significant impacts on, on the choices and constraints that individuals face in choosing uh, whether to move um, to and from the UK. And at the same time, um, unprecedented um, uh, changes uh, to uh, the way in which we try and measure um, population uh, movements uh, because of, of course, both the suspension of the International Passenger Survey um, at the start of the pandemic um, and the difficulties in uh, collecting data for the Labour Force Survey and Annual Population Survey, um, which will be much of the focus of today's discussion. Uh, now, I mean, these questions clearly matter hugely. It matters hugely um, uh, from every possible perspective, economic, political, social, and perhaps most of all at the moment um, in terms of, of, of health, um, uh, uh, in health terms, to know um, how many people, who, who's in the country, how many people are in the country, who is coming and going, um, how many people uh, live where. Um, so at this time when it's, it's a, a, a great importance, um, we find ourselves uh, struggling to, uh, to make sense of the data. Um, and I think um, this has generated a, uh, um, a lively debate um, among uh, um, both the people, those, those who are with us today and, and others. Um, I mentioned um, in particular, uh, um, Alan Manning, former chair of the Migration Advisory Committee, um, Ian Gordon, um, at the London School of Economics, who've also contributed to this debate. Um, I, I would say that um, this is a lively debate and there are some disagreements or differences of interpretation among us, but I, 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 I think this is very much um, a debate which has been con conducted in an extremely constructive spirit, both in academia and between the academic and research community and the Office of National Statistics. Um, we are all, I hope, on the same side, even if we, as I say, we may have slightly different perspectives. Um, we are all on the same side here. Um, we are trying as best we can to make sense of the data, to make sense of what's going on, and hopefully, um, and Becca, of course, will talk a bit more about this, um, to chart a way forward so that we improve our understanding of these factors. And I certainly um, have benefited um, greatly. Um, I've learned a lot from the debate. Um, I think it has, um, you know, we, we have had some answers. We've ha also had more questions. And I think there are probably, as I tweeted earlier today, there probably are still more questions than answers. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I do think that the, the fact of this debate and the fact that it has been conducted constructively, um, both within the research community and between the research and community and ONS, and I would praise the way that ONS has engaged with the research community on this topic, um, speaks well of the, uh, the, the state of uh, um, uh, population and statistics research in this country, and, and, and hopefully that, that is a good sign for the future. So um, I am going to uh, um, now hand over to Michael O'Connor, um, who uh, was my co-author on, on one of the first contributions to this debate uh, when we looked at the Labour Force Survey, um, who's going to talk through um, some of that work and uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the supplemental pieces of evidence um, that have emerged, uh, uh, have emerged since then. Um, so without any further ado, uh, over to you, Michael. Michael, you're on mute. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, Jonathan and I looked at essentially two matters uh, here. 
uh, the size of the UK population and the mix within that population, with a focus on its migrant component, <coughs> particularly in employment. Now, our starting point is that ONS methodology for estimating the population takes household survey-based results and it weights them up to a preordained population level. This is based on previously projected growth resulting from two components, natural change on the one hand, net migration on the other. And for 2020, that projected growth was about 400,000. Now, of course, pandemic-related excess deaths, uh, at the very least, suggested that natural change was likely to have been nil. And a range of anecdotal evidence, as well as the ONS surveys themselves, suggested that migrant numbers, and in particular, EU-born workers, might well have shrunk considerably rather than boosted the population. But the weighting methodology required the population to have grown. And the effect of this was to boost the UK born population to make up both for the drop in observations of migrants and to provide the growth projected for natural growth and net migration. Now, in contrast, our thought experiment, I think we can call it that, held the UK born population constant and inferred from that a considerable drop in the non-UK born population. And that led to us estimating a fall in UK population overall, rather than an increase. Now, while we heavily caveated our adjusted estimates, we concluded by comparing change in one large component of the population, the number of employees in the UK, with admin data uh, from HMRC. Now, as we <coughs> had at the end of our paper, a picture of this on a regional basis rather better aligned with our estimates than those coming out of the labour force survey and so it did seem to call into some question the ONS estimates. Now let's see if I can share some pictures. Right, I hope you can see there the chart that we had at the end of our little paper uh, showing change in various measures of employee change uh, by region. Uh, the red line is the uh, original labor force survey estimates, the green are adjusted estimates, and the blue uh, is the HMRC uh, admin data derived from their real time information system. Now note in particular that the ONS estimate of employee numbers actually increases in London uh, despite the pandemic, when the administrative data shows a movement of very similar magnitude but in the exact opposite direction. There are of course differences in coverage between HMRC and ONS that means the RTI and LFS series run at different levels but there's generally a very good match and change in the two series. As you can see from this, which is a picture of cumulative change since 2017, showing changes in RTI and LFS employee levels tracked each other very well until the start of the pandemic, upon which ONS estimates continued upwards, but HMRC numbers uh, saw us lose nearly a million people um, on payroll. A key explanation offered by ONS for this holding up of employee numbers was people newly realizing uh, when surveyed that they weren't self employed but were actually employees. So let's uh, look into this with a picture of change uh, within industry sectors from the labour force survey. This shows change in employment um, over the year. Quarter four 2019, quarter four 2020, uh, by main industrial sector and by employee and self employed status. <coughs> now you can see considerable differences in sectors here, uh, half increasing more or less, half decreasing. But almost all of the drop off in self employment, the pink bars there, was in job losing sectors where employee numbers dropped off too. Now it's possible that workers were misidentifying themselves in these sectors. But of course, if they were, and these individuals were always employees, then employee losses in these sectors would actually have been understated. 
but switching between self-employment and employment in the survey provides no explanation at all for the whole economy level because the holding up of the employee numbers overall in the LFS and indeed the limited fall in total employment results from ONS estimating really quite heavy employee gains in apparently winning sectors with professional activities, finance, government and education, putting on near enough a million jobs between them. Now intuitively, this just doesn't feel right over the course of the pandemic, um, <coughs> let alone in, in ordinary circumstances. The switching between a losing sector with jobs generally down at the lower end of the occupational classification uh, and a winning one with jobs generally up at the higher end seems frankly impossible. Now, nothing in these pandemic circumstances is completely impossible, but we can compare this LFS data with the HMRC RTI data, which is now being published by sector. Again, we're going to observe change because difference in levels of employees in RTI and LFS um, do exist, but as I said previously, the amount of change is generally a um, good matter. This chart has ONS employees and ONS all workers to show that switching between status doesn't make very much difference in between those two indicators, um, nor do they make much difference to the very stark differences between the ONS estimates of employment by sector and the HMRC RTI data. The RTI in a HMRC branded turquoise there shows falls in employment more or less all over, <laughs> with the only material increase quite unsurprisingly during the pandemic, being in health and social work. Notably, while there are decently sized RTI falls in the major ONS losing sectors, there are no corresponding gains in any of the ONS winning sectors, with the minor exception of public administration, which has an increase of 30,000, so a tenth or so of the size of the 300 or so that the Labour Force survey puts on. And this does seem a fairly strong pointer to people being magicked into existence methodologically who don't actually exist in reality. Now, what then of migrants? We have pointed out that HMRC can to some extent identify them in their data as having been issued a national insurance number as an adult non-UK national. And this could shed some light on whether there have in fact been any sign of the disproportionate loss of migrant workers. Now again, there are differences in coverage uh, between the LFS and the RTI. And these differences mean the HMRC data for non-EU migrants don't really match up very well with LFS estimates and, and never have. Uh, in particular, it seems, because uh, something between a quarter and a third of non-EU employees uh, appear to have arrived in the UK before the age of 16. So they aren't identified as migrants uh, in HMRC data. But the match is rather better for EU migrants, in particular for Eastern Europeans, um, who comprise uh, the majority of the EU workers. HMRC have now published, uh, so since uh, our, our publishing work, uh, published some RTI data by broad nationality grouping. Unfortunately, it's not sectoral, so I can't uh, compare with the, the previous slides, but they are broken down by region and they give this picture. So between 2019-Q4 and 2020-Q4, we indeed see a quite disproportionate loss of payroll employment among people who were adult EU nationals when they were issued a national insurance number. <coughs> of employees covered by RTI, they only need RTI if they've lost their employee job and they haven't got another one. And this indicator shows that EU employee payroll has been near enough decimated across the whole of the UK maybe one in eight EU employees in London lost to RTI, apparently lost to RTI over the course of the pandemic. And the key point is that this is markedly different from the experience of UK nationals in RTI, with the loss of EU nationals from payroll exceeding those of UK nationals by two or three times all over the country. And this could be taken to form a baseline for those who might well have been pushed to leave the UK 
to which would have to be added those who might left while remaining on payroll furloughed or working from home abroad, casual workers who were never in RTI in the first place, uh, and indeed the self-employed who are likely more affected by the pandemic even than employees. So, putting together the ONS estimations of sectoral changes in working uh, and the implausibility of those compared with the RTI information on from the board with this disproportionate real loss of employment among EU employees and its regional distribution, seems highly suggestive on the issues of both population size and mix. That the population probably has shrunk and that the shrinkage has resulted from something that the next first are prompted by a disproportionate pandemic related uh, economic issues. So what can we conclude from this about measuring population during the, the pandemic? Well, firstly, that the official statistics based on the labour force survey and the annual population survey uh, have an inherent weakness, which results from waiting up the household survey results uh, to a preordained population level. And this in particular means that we can't cope with rapid change. Arguably, we saw this happen in one direction following the eastward expansion of the EU in 2004 and constraining the LFS ABS to projected change then meant that by census 2011, the estimated stock of EU migrants was some hundreds of thousands lower than the actual number who then appeared in the census. And it seems quite possible that this might now have happened with change in the other direction. The ONS have, of course, had in hand for some years now um, an extensive transformation programme in training. And this plans to use a wide range of admin data with technical advances and legal changes to make it increasingly available. And the pandemic driven use of uh, faster economic indicators, as they're called, has also shown the possibility of using commercial data too. But all of this has been in the future for some time now. And so if there is a criticism to be made, it's that official statistics on some key indicators, very important to policy, like regional sectoral employment that I pictured in the slides, which continue to derive just from the Labour Force Survey, they're merely a cautionary note a year on from the start of the pandemic. When administrative data suggests that some of these might really be quite inaccurate, and one might think that now is the time at least to use these data um, for at least calibration of some of the survey based estimates. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I think that, that was very clear. You were a little uh, low in volume, but I think uh, I, I hope everyone um, heard and, and certainly the slides were, were clear enough. Um, so without further ado, I will pass on to um, Madeline. Uh, Madeline um, Sumption, of course, is the Directory of the Migration Observatory at the University of Oxford. Madeline. Super, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation um, to join. Now that the piece that I wrote that I think resulted in the invitation to join this panel is now a little bit out of, out of date. It was earlier on in this, in this debate and various bits and pieces of, of data have arrived since then, including the RTI data that, uh, that Michael mentioned. But I thought I would just kind of say a little bit about the key points um, uh, that I think do still stand, um, particularly when thinking about sort of how we use the LFS in this uh, in this COVID era. Um, and essentially, I mean, the, the main point that I was making is that um, it, it looks like migrant um, non-response has increased potentially a fair amount in the LFS as a result of, of the pandemic. And that this um, is driving quite a lot of the decrease in the, the migrant population that the LFS is, is measuring. And that is also driving because of the population issues that, um, that Michael uh, mentioned. It's, uh, but not just because of that, it, it's also driving some of the increase in this sort of this magical arrival of new UK born people in, in the population. And that actually changes in non-response could in fact be more important than the population waiting issues. Um, 
in explaining that um, essentially because even if you have a decreased population, when your migrant share of the population goes down, um, obviously the, the UK born share um, goes up, even if we were correctly accounting for, for the, the, you know, even if we knew exactly what the population was. Um, now, all of this is incredibly um, uh, uncertain, and so it's kind of really difficult to um, point to the kind of precise magnitudes, but I'll just start with kind of, I guess, maybe say a little bit about the sort of theory behind migrant non-response and why it should have changed. Um, because I do think that it's something ex ante that we should expect, given what happened during the pandemic. Um, so in general, I think we expect migrant, you know, there is evidence that um, that migrant non-response can be different from, um, uh, from the kind of response rates of domestic populations to, um, to household surveys. Um, there are various reasons, but there, you know, there are a couple of useful studies on non-response, uh, mostly from, from other European countries, but essentially, you know, language barriers are an issue, they make it harder to respond, and it's a less comfortable experience if you're not a confident, um, uh, a confident speaker of, of the language. Migrants may also have lower um, sort of institutional knowledge or trust in surveying institutions, uh, particularly if they recently arrived, and in general they often share the traits of um, of other people that have higher non-response rates. So, for example, um, you know, young people or people in, in, in rented accommodation. Um, <clears throat> now, all of this stuff obviously was an issue before the pandemic. And actually, there was a useful study that ONS did looking at non-response, uh, LFS non-response based on the 2011 census, um, which um, found that in addition to um, uh, the fact that migrants are young and more likely to live in rented accommodation, they, there was also a sort of migrant specific effect on non-response that foreign born household heads were less likely to, um, to, to respond. Um, so, um, so we have these, um, it, well, so we know that there are some issues there, but there was also some kind of underlying uncertainty even before, it, before COVID came along. There are various things that don't look quite right in the LFS um, that suggest that we have some um, particular problems with newly arriving, um, uh, newly arriving migrants being being picked up in the LFS. I'm going to attempt to share. Um, ooh, hang on, it's asking if I want to leave the webinar. No, I don't. Um, uh, let me attempt to share a slide. Um, and apologies that um, uh, these are not more nicely formatted. Um, okay. Um, is that is that showing up? Um, it's yes, it is. But uh, um, you make it full. You'll have to make it full screen for us to be able to see what's going on. I think. Right. Um, okay. I'm picking the full screen. Oh yeah. Okay. Is that is that better? It's better. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So this. Um, uh, and I don't know if other people, for other people, the title is obscured by the little, um, the, by the buttons at the top of the Zoom thing, but um, this basically is showing the different cohorts of migrants arriving um, uh, in 2011 to 2015, how many of them are still, um, how many of them show up then in kind of subsequent years of, of data. Um, so for, so the, the dark blue line, for example, the, uh, the one that goes all the way up to year eight, that's people arriving in 2011. How many of those do we see in 2012, 13, 14, 15, et cetera? Now we know that there's a lot of churn and um, migration we know from things like the now, um, well, no longer potentially defunct um, International Passenger Survey that a lot of people do, do emigrate, especially in the first five years. So this line, these lines ought to slope down actually quite substantially. I mean, if the IPS is right, we're talking, um, you know, I guess sort of for EU citizens, 100, 150,000 departures a year, um, plus for non EU citizens, this is the whole foreign born population. So these ought to be really kind of steeply downward sloping lines at the beginning, then tailing off after people have been here a number of years and are less likely to leave. And we don't see that apart from the 20, you see a little bit of a decrease in the 2015 line, but basically that um, these cohorts are, um, are not decreasing in the way that they, they ought to, which to me basically suggests that I'm, I, I'm assuming that the the only plausible reason for this is essentially that migrant non-response non is decreasing over time, the longer they've been here, more comfortable um, responding, um, better language skills or whatever it is, and that that, um, uh, you know, uh, so that sort of non-response problem gets less and that's why we don't see the decrease that we would, um, that we would expect to. So that's just a sort of, I guess, a long way of saying that we know some of these issues around um, migrant non-response 
aren't likely to exist. So then the question is, you know, is this, did this get worse during the pandemic and did it get disproportionately worse, um, you know, compared to factors driving non-response for, um, for, for the UK born? Um, now, just a brief background in terms of what happened um, uh, during the, the pandemic. So we had a shift um, in the way that people were recruited into the survey um, from uh, this to door-to-door -door knocking to more um, remote methods of, of contact. People get sent a letter. They then are invited to, res to respond proactively and give their phone number. If they don't respond, some of them can be chased up if their number can be obtained um, through telematching um, processes. Um, but in many cases, that's that's not available. So the question is, are migrants less likely to, uh, even less likely to respond to this new uh, format using a letter, um, or potentially less likely to be in the in the phone uh, databases? Um, and my, I would argue that probably yes. I mean, just anecdotally, as someone who spent time living abroad, it's it's quite stressful talking on the phone, in particular as a non-native speaker, much more so than talking to people in. Um, uh, in person. And so if you have people who are reluctant, you know, I think phone may be a particular deterrent for migrants, but also in general, they may be more likely if they're reluctant to respond anyway, um, and that kind of nudge of a knock on the door may be more important for them. Um, there's one really interesting Danish study um, that looked at non-response among migrants. They implemented a survey where they used admin data as a sampling frame and they compare the response rates among um, various migrant and, um, and Danish groups. And they initially tried to contact people. They want to do it on the phone. They initially tried to contact people on the phone. If that fails, then they, um, they try face to face. Um, and they found lower total response rates among migrants, but they also found crucially that migrants were more likely to need face to face contact um, in order to respond to the survey. So you had about, I think it was 93% of of Danes were interv interviewed by phone, but it was only um, 67 to 76% of, uh, of migrants, depending on which migrant group in, um, in particular. So kind of ex ante, I think, you know, we should expect this change in surveying method to affect uh, migrants more. And that does seem to have happened. If you look basically at the, um, uh, the data, uh, the data um, looking, depending on when people were recruited into the survey. So as um, as you will know, there are five waves to the LFS. Um, some people, so at any one point in time, um, at least um, during most of 2020, we had people who had been recruited under the old method and under the new method. So here, the blue line waves one to two. Um, this is what happens if we look at the foreign born, and apologies for the typo, foreign born share of the population um, in whichever quarter we're looking at. Um, but only looking at people who were who had been recruited. Well, waves one to two is the most recent wave. So those are the people who were recruited after the beginning of the pandemic. Um, waves three to five is the people who were recruited before. And as you can see, um, we see a much sharper decline in the estimated migrant share among people um, who were recruited under the under the new method, suggesting that um, that a fair amount of the decline was related to the method rather than um, to emigration alone. Um, now, various other people have done um, more sophisticated versions of this analysis. Ian Gordon um, also did ran some interesting numbers coming to a similar conclusion that non-response um, has been quite a big issue in explaining the change over time that the LFS is, um, that, that picture the LFS is giving us of the, the migrant population. Um, it is, you know, there's a, there's a real limitation to this sort of analysis, which is it's um, it's a one-time only thing. You can't, um, you know, we just have this, this very limited period where we had people recruited under both the, the old method and the new method. Um, you know, sample size relatively small. We know, you know, that in any, in normal times, you get sort of fluctuations in LFS estimates of the migrant population that aren't actually that easy to explain um, based on, you know, what actually happens in the world or just on even on um, normal, kind of even sampling error. Um, Issues, so I, I think we probably can't read too much into this this sort of analysis. It's a sort of suggestive um, uh, data, but but I don't think it it's possibly actually possible really to get the sort of the precise answers from the LFS about what actually happened. Um, <clears throat> we do see from the RTI data that um, uh, that Michael already. Um, flagged, I think is really interesting um, because it, you know, we, we see that there are quite big discrepancies between the RTI data and, um, and the LFS. And if you look at the sort of migrant specific piece of that, um, oops, 
Okay, here we go. So um, this is basically just um, an attempt at a vaguely comparable um, uh, set of figures. So you've got what the RTI is saying is the uh, change in the, the number of employees between the last quarter of 2019 and the last quarter of 2020. And then what, is, what does the LFS say? And the LFS figures include, um, that's by country of birth, um, in order to be more comparable to the RTI measure of people who were a foreign national when they got their um, national insurance number, but not necessarily anymore. And um, essentially what we, um, what we see is that um, for, is, is a, is quite a different picture, particularly so that LFS is suggesting a decline in the number of non-EU um, employees, whereas the RTI data was actually suggesting basically no change, tiny, um, a tiny increase. And then obviously you've got this sort of, you know, totally opposite picture on, on the UK born. Um, so LFS showing a big increase and the RTI showing, um, showing a, big, a big decrease. So um, I guess the question here, how do I stop sharing? Okay. Um, the, um, where does this leave us? Um, I mean, I think sort of what I would conclude from all this, there's basically there's huge uncertainty about what happens to, em particularly to emigration. Um, I think we can conclude pretty confidently that something in the LFS isn't working for measurement of the migrant population. Um, this, there was always, you know, this was probably always the case. Um, you know, there were always issues around, around migrant non-response as I, as I mentioned, um, and that is now, um, more of a problem um, than than it was in the in the short term. Um, we, what it means is, firstly, as more waves of you know as you go to then the last quarter of 20, um, uh, 20 and into 21, 2021, the pre pandemic waves are kind of gradually working their way out of the sample, and so. Um, uh, so the issue is going to get worse um, over time, and then in the long run, presumably, as ONS attempts to fix the issue, either with, um, you know, obviously there's been kind of introduction of incentives and that sort of thing, but then presumably we'll have a return to face-to-face -face, um, recruiting, and then um, at that point, one would presumably expect the, the migrant share of the population to, to jump back up again. Um, so, um, you know, so that I think all um, has a lot of implications basically for how analysts use the LFS. And I think um, one has to be very cautious about any analysis using, you know, change, change over time, um, obviously, yeah, for anyone, but particularly for the, for the migrant population. Um, my feeling personally is that the 2019 data actually is more, it's probably more reliable as a rep reflection of what's happening now than the 2020 data. Which I just I kind of don't really trust at all. But um, I will be. It will be interesting to see. I know ONS is working, is doing a lot of analysis on this um, on this issue and uh, kind of looking into the details. And it'll uh, it'll be really interesting to hear um, more from, from Becca about the plans, including for a, to you know possible reweighting that might help to um, obviously we can't kind of necessarily provide a magic solution to what is in some ways an intractable problem uh, visited on us by, by COVID, but, um, uh, but you know, may help to sort of address some of the symptoms at least um, in, in the short term. Um, uh, thank you very much, Madeline. Um, that was very clear. Um, and I'll now pass over to um, Becca Briggs, who is the Deputy Dir Director of the Center for International Migration at the Office of National Statistics um, to um, comment and respond on, on some of these issues around the LFS and outline um, where next uh, for measuring population and migration um, from the ONS's perspective. Uh, Becca. Thanks, Jonathan. So um, I'm Becca Briggs. I'm actually now Deputy Director for Coordination and Change in Public Policy Analysis, but work across a lot of the work we're doing on migration, population and the labour market. So one second, I will just share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that now. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So um, what I'm going to do is talk about how ONS have been working to provide an evolving picture of UK population change since the pandemic, um, set out our latest work on methods, um, statistics and analysis in this area, what this shows um, and what's coming up next. So I'll start with some context. 
Um, population statistics are a central part of what we do here at ONS um, and as Jonathan set out at the start informs some of the most significant decisions across the country. So having a good understanding of the population and um, the number of people living and working here in the UK um, how this is changing is crucial for the public and for policy makers um, and of course with the pandemic that's made that even more important with significant interest um, and a real need for insights on how the population has changed through the last year um, and what what this means for society and the economy. Um, but at the same time, the pandemics also, uh, as, as others have set out here, had an impact on how we collect data at ONS, such as on some of our regular surveys like the LFS and the IPS. Um, and we've needed to adapt our methods to address measurement challenges. Um, and we've been updating on this regularly in series of articles and blogs over the last year. Um, though at the same time as it's presented challenges, um, it's also brought new opportunities. Um, and we've been working hard to explore and implement ways to produce brand new insights, um, to collaborate even more closely with analysts across government, academia and beyond to draw together the best available data, um, all with that aim to paint the best possible picture of the population. So I'm going to focus on a summary of our work to do just this across our population, migration and labour market statistics. Um, which are all closely related, um, both in terms of how we measure population size, but also in telling the story of what's changed since the pandemic. So firstly, a bit of context around population statistics. So we publish our official mid-year population estimates annually, which are based on previous census and rolled forward to take account of changes to births, deaths and migration. Um, our mid-2020 estimates are due to be published in June, so I think the challenge and opportunity here has been how we can deliver insights ahead of our usual schedule to help understand changes since the pandemic. Um, and to do this, what we've done is produce new early indicators of UK population size. Um, and as I just mentioned, a key part of understanding the population is understanding international migration. So um, as others have set out, a, a challenge here has been that our previous main source for migration statistics, the International Passenger Survey, um, which takes place at ports and airports, was suspended in March 2020 um, due to the pandemic um, and the impact on survey operations. Um, but we'd already been working across government to transform our long term international migration flow statistics using administrative data. Um, so things such as immigration, national insurance number and education records. So um, what we did is adapt our plans to accelerate this work and really move ahead with developing new methods. Um, and that includes work to model migration flows um, for the period post pandemic. And then moving on to look at our labour market statistics, which use the labour force survey where where we've had to adapt to the new circumstances we're in with the move from face-to-face -to, -face to telephone surveying here. Um, and as others have said, since then, we've seen changes in, in the mix of people responding to the survey, um, including falls in the numbers of new, new non-UK born people that were being picked up, which led to see some of the discussions we're having here around where the changes in the LFS estimates, which are weighted to our official population estimates and projections that were produced before the pandemic, indicated a fall in the non-UK and therefore the overall population so to shed light on this topic, we've looked at wider data sources that can tell us more about how the employee population is changing over the last year. So now I'll move on to give um, a brief summary of some of our recent publications across these topics and the main findings. So um, I'll start um, where in April we published the early indicators of population change that I just mentioned. So this showed that um, rather than a fall, the UK population grew to 67.1 million by mid 2020, although this is a 0.5% annual increase from mid 2019, which marks one of the smallest increases seen in the context of recent years, as shown on the chart which is showing um, annual population percentage change over time. Um, so this was reflecting a higher number of deaths, a continued decrease in births being offset by a high level of net international migration, which I'll come on to shortly. I think it's helpful to just note here that these are indicators um, that we've developed based on sort of new methods. They're not our official estimates, which are coming in the summer, but as I said, really provide those early insights on overall population size. So moving on, um, an element of getting to these early indicators is obviously estimating international migration, um, how that's changing and what that means for the population. So um, the suspension of the IPS has led us to look at innovative approaches for how we can understand migration um, post March 2020. 
where we've been bringing in insights from travel um, and border data to help us model the impact of the pandemic. Um, so what did this show? So the chart here looks at cumulative total net migration. And for the year ending June 2020, if you look at the top line, um, net migration was around 282,000. So still showing more people moving long term than leaving. However, this is largely reflecting pre-pandemic patterns uh, where net migration to March was higher than what we'd seen in some of the recent years. But following March, that's where we can really start to see the change in patterns following the pandemic, so the impact of travel restrictions and changes to behaviour, um, with net migration becoming negative for that latest quarter, around minus 50,000. If I move on to break this down further, um, we can see different patterns for different nationality groups. So in the chart on the left of this slide for non-EU nationals, we see net migration um, continuing to be higher than what we've seen in previous years, and that was at around 282,000 by the year ending June 2020. Whereas for EU, that middle chart, we actually see net migration falling to um, slightly negative, and that bottom line on the chart here really shows those changes post March. And then for um, British nationals, the chart on the right, where net migration became slightly positive, which is also different to patterns from recent years where we've typically seen net outflows. So this modelling um, is a new method. There's obviously uncertainty around the estimates given the pandemic. They're, they're provisional at this stage, but we'll be continuing to develop our work on this through the year. So what I'm going to do now is just touch on some of our broader um, migration uh, statistics developments, which we also published in April, um, because we're bringing in administrative data sources to help us develop a new method for measuring migration in future. So moving away from the IPS towards what we're calling admin based migration estimates or ABMEs, which is something we've been working really closely um, across government statistical service on with other government departments. Um, and here you can see some of the provisional results from our time series of admin based migration estimates up to March 2020, which were created predominantly using a data set called RAPID, the Registration and Population Interactions Database from DWP, which provides a single coherent review of interactions across the breadth of benefits and earnings data for anyone with a national insurance number, so bringing across linked data from HMRC2. And what we've done is use this to measure aggregate numbers who've moved to and left the country on a long term basis and um, using the activity in these systems. And so this marks a real step forward in, in our transformation of these statistics. Um, and just to kind of go through some of the results here, while our new approach is different, so not directly comparable with some of our old survey based methods. If we look at the chart on the left, which looks at the overall net migration um, for non UK nationals. The overall trends and levels are similar when we compare estimates for rapid data alongside our previous migration statistics based on the IPS. But if we look at the two charts on the right, there are different patterns when this is broken down for EU and non-EU. So again, where trends are mirroring broadly what we saw in our migration statistics based on the IPS, but we can see higher net migration for EU nationals and lower for non-EU nationals. So why do we think this is? Um, well, for some time we, we've noted that the IPS was stretched beyond its original purpose and that certain groups um, such as um, EU nationals were likely to have some uncertainty in their intentions for how long they moved to the UK for, which was making it harder to measure using an intentions-based survey. Whereas with administrative data, what we can do is pick up actual data um, on movements into and out of the country. Um, there's some further points to note here, whereas for, for non-EU, where, where RAPID is more of a sort of economic data system, we know there's like to be some under coverage of students. So we've been making adjustments here and are going to be continuing our work to develop this and improve the coverage in future. Um, these are our first set of admin based estimates, um, so they're not yet official statistics and our work is going to continue to evolve in this space, um, including ongoing work um, with Home Office immigration system data as well. But what it's showing is some of the important developments we're making on, on new methods and approaches. And so what I'll do now is just move on to some key updates um, around labour market statistics and work taking place to refine the population totals that underpin how we weight our estimates from the labour force survey. So as I mentioned earlier, um, and as others have touched on um, in their presentations too, um, due to the pandemic, we needed to move the survey from face-to-face -to, -face to telephone operations um, back in March, which led to some changes in the mix of people we saw responding to the survey as we needed to adapt our methods. 
Um, and so what we've been doing since then, I think firstly to pick up in October, we introduced a change to the weighting to take account of the fact we were seeing a reduced proportion of rented households responding to the survey. Um, since then, we've also obviously been looking at where we've seen that reduction in non-UK nationals responding since the pandemic. And due to the way we weight the responses up to fixed population estimates, which um, were also produced in that pre-pandemic period, we were seeing some increases in UK nationals in our estimates. So what we've been doing is looking for other sources of data to help us understand um, the extent to which this reflects real population change or changes to response. And I'll move on to this shortly. Oh, sorry, just moving back to that slide there. So what we've been doing is working closely with HMRC. Um, and in March, we've published new analysis from the real-time information tax system, which when linked to national insurance number data, tells us more about the nationality of employees. So this showed that the reduction in non-UK nationals was smaller for payroll employees in RTI than what we were seeing in LFS data. So around 4% compared to 15% um, year on year, 2019 to 2020. And this is suggesting that the LFS estimates are likely to be overstating some of the changes in the non-UK population. So what we're going to do is use these insights um, to help create a new method for, for weighting the LFS and model population totals for the survey. Um, so it's worth noting here that this is different from our official population estimates. But RTI is a really good source here because it provides timely and relevant data um, for labour market statistics, including at regional level and by nationality for re-weighting purposes. So what I'll do now is move on to a summary of what's coming up next. So overall, um, the work we're doing in this space is iterative and we'll be continuing to refine our methods and our understanding across population migration and the labour market as we bring in new data. Um, in doing this, we're going to be continuing to work really closely across um, the government statistical service to draw together the best data and insights. Um, I think what we sort of said here is that really no single source has the answer. So we're looking to try and draw together multiple insights to provide the best possible picture. Um, we're seizing the opportunities too to be radical and ambitious in how we're developing our core statistics. So thinking about new ways we can measure the things that matter to the public and policy makers. Um, and this is all building towards um, our ambition to deliver a transformed population statistics system in future um, using administrative data. We'll be providing regular updates um, throughout this work and are building in user and expert feedback as we go. So I think I think just to sum up on a few um, key dates on some of the work that I've just been talking about. So um, this month, next week, in fact, we'll be updating on the LFS re-weighting methods I just covered. Um, then in June, we'll be publishing our official mid-year population estimates for mid-2020. Um, in July, we're then planning to um, implement the re-weighting to the LFS. And then throughout the year, we'll be continuing to update on our wider population and migration stats transformation. Um, and then looking further ahead, um, we'll be delivering uh, really rich insights from the 2021 census in 2022 for England and Wales. Uh, and then in 2023, that's when we're looking to move towards our reformed population and migration stat system. So um, that's it from me for now, uh, but we're really keen to get further feedback, um, obviously through Q&A and after the session. There's an email address here that you can use to get in touch, but um, I'll stop there for now and hand back to Jonathan for Q&A. Um, thank you very much indeed, Becca. Um, plenty of uh, material to chew on there. Um, so, um, uh, attendees, please do pop any questions in the Q and A. Um, you should be able to see it there. Um, please do uh, do ask questions now. We've got uh, um, just about uh, ten minutes or so. Um, I have uh, lots of questions. So while while you're doing that, uh, um, um, I will uh, uh, kick off with with one, um, uh, with, which um, I think go you know could potentially go to any of you, but um, it's what happened. Looking back at what happened pre-pandemic, so Madeline, you said um, that uh, uh, you know you placed more reliance in the LFS in, on, on the LFS statistics from 2019 than those from 2020, and I think we understand why. On the other hand, if you look at the LFS-based estimates for the number the number of people resident in this country who are citizens of Romania as of the end of 2019, in other words, before any of this happened, um, the, uh, the uh, published estimate is 400,000. If you look at the number of Romanians who have already uh, registered for the EU settled status scheme um, to register their right to reside here, 
um, it's already over 800,000 and rising, um, so twice as large. And while, of course, um, we know that there may be some that there may be some explanations of that difference, um, that rather suggests that this 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 issue you 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 um, raised of migrant non-response, particularly uh, I, 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 among recently arrived um, Europeans. Um, seems to have been something that was arguably a major factor um, even before the pandemic. So how does that change you know, our picture of what's happened over the last decade? Um, that also re reflects, of course, what, what uh, Becca showed us in terms of the re-estimation of international migration using the rapid data. Um, and how does it affect our interpretation of, of the census in due course? Any, any, anyone? Sorry, want is that to one to me? Or? Well, it could be either you or Becca, <laughs> or both. I mean, I think the census is going to be crucial for um, uh, getting a, an updated sense of, of where we are with, with the LFS. I mean, I think one of the reasons that, the, that I, I trust the 2019 data more is essentially that I think, yet yeah, the the, the data are already a little low uh, looking in the LFS. And so something that's decreased them even further um, seems, seems problematic. And so I think probably using 2019, you know, those figures might even, the 2019 figures might even still be too low, um, even for what's going on in, in 2021. Um, presumably, we, there will be a somewhat similar process of kind of rewriting the history of, of migration that we had after the, the 2011 census. Um, when we get those figures and we can get a sense of, um, uh, you know, what, how the numbers are different from, from the LFS, because I, my sense is that there, there could, it could be that quite a big gap has, um, has opened up. Becca, anything uh, on that? Yeah, so I'll touch on a few points here, because I think um, one of the things probably should draw out a bit there, because I know you sort of mentioned it there, Jonathan, um, in terms of the EU settlement scheme. So we set out a bit of a note on this um, last year, because um, um, as ever, where there's multiple different sources out there, um, some of the key points to understand are where there are sort of those definitional differences and coverage differences, um, where uh, the coverage of what we've got in the Labour Force Survey and the Annual Population Survey um, could be quite different to what is there in the EU settlement scheme, uh, where there are certain groups that would be included um, in our statistics and, and, and not in the EU settlement scheme and vice versa. So thinking about some of those that can apply for the scheme that wouldn't be included, uh, the fact that we don't have communal establishments in, in the LFS and APS. Um, uh, and I think there's there's just some sort of key points to, to note there um, around that. And I think also sort of just to touch on what Madeline was saying there, where um, as I sort of set out at the end of the presentation, where uh, we obviously are looking ahead to the rich insights from the census and what that will be able to tell us about migration um, as well. Uh, and I think, again, probably just to touch on the fact that, as we said, for, for the, the LFS throughout this year, what we'll be looking to do, as I said, is continue to refine our methods, look at the reweighting. Um, and building further data sources as we go. Can I just add there on the, the settlement scheme? Because I mean, I've been a big proponent of not comparing the, the LFS with the settlement scheme data for all sorts of reasons that, that Becca mentions, you know, different definitions. The particular issue that I'm most concerned about is just people who've gone home because the settlement scheme essentially is measuring anyone who's ever, you know, apply, you know been in the UK, gone on to apply since it opened um, a couple of years ago. Um, and you know we don't know how many of those people are left. That said, that sort of my position that has been my position on things. The discrepancy now we're looking at discrepancy of two million people, and you kind of think, well, that is starting to, you know, look like something that's pretty hard to explain through these kind of definitional um, differences. And, and people, you know, have we had two million people who um, applied for the settlement scheme and then went home over the last couple of years? Probably not. So I think, yeah, I think it's probably sort of. I imagine it's a combination of those of those factors, the definitional differences, and then and a genuine issue of um, yeah undercounting of migrants in the the population data. Just yes, to, I mean uh, sorry, Michael. Just on the point, uh, Jonathan, there uh, of definition. Uh, bear in mind the indicates we've been looking at. So whether it's the IPS, or the new rapid uh, as described by Becker, uh, or indeed the LFS APS, is there's a group of people who are unobserved by design, who are 
people who are only here for the short term. So there's nothing to do with their intentions, it's what the actual outcome is. Um, you know, people who are, because the, uh, to be included in the LFS ABS, uh, the UK has to be your, it has to be your place of normal residence, or you have to have been here uh, for a considerable time. Um, the IPS, uh, the headline statistics only count long-term international migration uh, and rapid as so far described uh, is similarly so you can only to pick up people who count as long-term international migrants i people who are here for at least a year or so now in terms of population who's here though, um if there is uh, and again this might be the partial explanation uh, for the uss numbers uh, say a rotating stock of quarter of a million romanians <laughs> means there are a quarter of a million romanians here none of whom because they're a rotating stock and they simply churn around, ever appear uh, in any estimate of long-term international migration and are never picked up um, in, in the LFS or, or the APS. Now, to some extent, they will appear in admin data if they work, if they're in the formal economy, if their employers reporting them uh, via RTI. But my view is the EUSS discrepancy is explained partly, as Madeline says, by people who have been here in the past and they want to retain, retain the right to come here. Um, but it might also indicate that there has been a very large unobserved population who have been omitted by design, uh, both uh, from the uh, flows-based monitoring through the IPS and indeed through the stock-based uh, estimates uh, via the LFS and APS. Can I ask Becca, you referred to um, reweighting the labor force survey using the RTI data. Um, and I can, I guess, understand that in respect of those people in the LFS who are employees, but by definition, the RTI data only covers employees. Um, so how, 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 um, how does that work for the very large number of people in the LFS who are self-employed or, or inactive or, 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 or whatever are not uh, not not actually um going to show up in the rta data in, in, in any form how how do we reweight those people yeah so i can i'm come on and give it a little bit more um background to some of the reweighting but i was actually going to touch on i think some of the points that um, michael was just raising as mm -hmm. well because i i think what what you were saying there um is, is actually quite a, an interesting part of some of our, our work going forward on on transforming um migration statistics um, and indeed population statistics more widely um where i think what we, we've set out before as part of of um, the work we're looking at is thinking very much about the concepts and definitions that we measure now, um, but what is potentially needed in future. So a lot of our work has obviously been aligning with the UN definition of um, long term international migration and that kind of 12 month or more rule um, for people moving to the country to be counted into those. Um, but I think obviously we, we're living in a, in a very sort of different different world now. We know people's travel patterns um, are changing. So where are the opportunities? Um, for us to do things differently, provide alternative analyses in future. So that's something where I think where we're moving towards administrative data and making greater use of that. What we very much want to do is look at where we can potentially introduce broader concepts um, and understand that in a bit more depth. So I think the work we've done so far with RAPIDS is obviously focused on some of those existing definitions. But I think what we want to be doing in future is obviously looking at those broader opportunities for how we can measure things differently. Um, and so there's something we've, we've published published reports on that previously, um, sort of setting out some of our, our thinking in that space, but again, always keen to kind of gather views and feedback on that too. But um, Jonathan, just to touch on your points on, on the reweighting. Um, so um, as you say, our RTI as a source is obviously very focused on the employee population, but um, does give us some, I think, really rich signals, which obviously we were able to use um, in the report we published in March to help us give more sort of insights as to what that might tell us about population change. Um, but I think also crucially here as a source um, provides us more context on that regional level change. Again, we published some information on that in March. Um, but I think as we uh, move forward with those methods, um, like I said, we're due to publish a report on that soon, we will be looking at how we can use wider data sources to inform the reweighting. I think try to look at how we can get that broader population picture. Thanks very much. Um, so 
if there are no questions from the audience, which I cannot see, then it's bang on 5.45. Um, it's been a uh, long conference and uh, um, uh, so uh, uh, I'm sure everyone's eager to go off to the, uh, um, the, the, the literal or metaphorical bar. Um, so uh, I will now pass, thank, uh, thank you very much to um, our, our panelists, um, Michael O'Connor, Madeline Sumption and Becca Briggs. Um, and thanks to ESCO for hosting us. Um, and I will hand over to uh, um, uh, Rebecca Riley to close the conference.